In this video, I'll introduce basic expected return and risk calculations for portfolios of assets. And to keep things simple, we'll just use a two-asset portfolio. We can think of any asset as having some expected return and some variance. And we'll denote the expected return as the expected value of R and we'll denote the variance as sigma squared. Now recall sigma is equal to the standard deviation. And so if you know one, uh, you know the other. So if you know the variance, you just take the square root and you have the standard deviation. Now think of a portfolio as just some basket of assets and each of the portfolio's member assets will have its own unique weight and we'll call the weight W. This weight reflects the, the proportion of the portfolio's value accounted for by that asset. So if one-fourth of a portfolio's total value is in Apple stock, we would say Apple's weight or W Apple is equal to 0.25. Now, if we know each asset's weight, expected return, variance, and have some indication of how the asset's returns move alongside one another, we can compute the portfolio's expected return and variance. So we can compute expected RP, expected return for the portfolio, and sigma squared P, the portfolio variance. Now, as I said earlier, uh, to keep things simple, we're going to be focusing on a two-asset case, but all of the concepts that I cover will extend to multiple assets. It's just the formulas for expected return and variance become longer and more complex as we add assets. Starting with some definitions and notation, we'll just call the assets asset one and asset two. And so we'll have weights for each and returns for each. And we'll also take as given that in any portfolios we think about, all weights are going to sum to one. And so in this special case of a two asset portfolio, W2 is equal to one minus W1. And so in some of our formulas, we might see some substitution going on where we don't actually uh, write W2, we simply write 1 minus W1. So we can write it either way. Now, the portfolio return is a very simple calculation. It's just a weighted average of the component returns. And so you can see that here. The return on the portfolio is the weight of asset 1 times the return on 1 plus the weight of asset 2 times the return of asset 2. And the same concept, the weighted average concept, is true for expected return as well. So you'll note that all we've done here is put expectation operators around each of the components. And we like to talk about expected returns because we really want to be forward looking. So we want to be thinking about well, what, what, is, what is an investor expecting uh, before taking on an investment. The calculation is really straightforward for portfolio return, so I'll illustrate quickly with an example. You combine two assets in a portfolio. You've got asset one with its expected return of 12%, and then asset two with its expected return of 8%. You're going to put 40% of the portfolio weight in asset one, so that's W1. The remainder, so W2 is equal to 1 minus W1 which is equal to 0.6. So the remainder goes in asset two. Um, you're asked to calculate the portfolio's expected return. We can solve the problem by just inserting the appropriate numbers into the portfolio expected return formula. And so for the weights, we're gonna have 0.4 and 0.6. And for the two expected returns, we'll have 0.12 and 0.0. Eight, and this turns out to be 0.096 or 
The variance computation is a little bit more complicated. Similar to what we saw in the expected return calculation, it's a combination that includes component weights and component variances. And be sure to note all of the squared terms that you see here. This is a variance calculation. And so we've got component variances and the weight terms are weights squared. So the first term here then is literally the weight squared times a variance. The second term is a weight squared times a variance. Now seeing that these individual variances do enter into the equation, it's apparent that all else equal, if you put riskier assets into a portfolio, you end up with a riskier portfolio. But that's not the full story. There is a third term here. And looking at that third term, we see many things that we already recognize. We've got a couple of weights. We've got a couple of standard deviations. But the critical value here, though, is this row term. This is the correlation between the two assets, and it describes the extent to which the asset returns move together. You should already realize that combining assets into a portfolio can reduce total risk. This is called diversification. Now mathematically, it's the correlation term in this equation that we just discussed that tells us how strong the diversification effect will be. Correlation can be between negative one and positive one. And if it's on the low end of this range, then there will be great diversification benefits. To see this, go back to the former equation and just insert some negative value here. So if you have a negative correlation, you'll see that this last big term actually drives down total portfolio variance and risk is reduced. In the case of negative correlation, you'll see that losses in one asset are often offset by gains in another. Now in the extreme case of a correlation of minus one, we would say the assets are perfectly negatively correlated. If that's the case, then you could arrange the portfolio in a manner to achieve a zero variance or a risk-free portfolio. If correlation's on the high end of this scale, however, there'll be little diversification benefit. Again, look at the equation and insert a positive value here. If you have a positive row, this whole last term is positive, and the greater the row, the greater the portfolio variance, or the greater the risk. And so with positive correlation, you're going to have assets that tend to gain at the same time or lose at the same time. So there's little to no offsetting uh, of, of gains and losses between them. In the extreme case of row equals one, we'd say the securities are perfectly positively correlated. There, there's absolutely no diversification benefit. Moving to an example for portfolio variance and standard deviation, the calculation is a little cumbersome, but if you know the formula, it's a pretty straightforward exercise. So this example is the, the same example we used before um, with asset one and asset two, except I've given you here um, their respective standard deviations and a correlation. So recall, we've got a weight for asset one of 0.4, and since the remainder is in asset two, W2 is going to equal 0.6. Let's now just insert numbers into the formula and go. And I want you to pay particular attention to the squared terms. Okay, so this, this first term here is going to be a, a weight squared times a variance. So the weight for asset one is 0.4. And so that's going to be 
0.4 squared in the formula, and then you're multiplying by a variance, but you were given a standard deviation. So here we need 0.5 squared, and then for the second term, we'll follow the same framework. So we need a weight squared times a variance. Again, you're given a standard deviation, so you need to enter 0.45 squared. And then you'll add this last term, so it's 2 times the product of the two weights times the correlation times the product of the two standard deviations. So we have 0.5 times 0.45. This equals 0.1453. Now remember, that's the variance. So what's the standard deviation? Standard deviation is just the square root of this number, and that's 0.3812. Now, in the real world of stocks, you'll never find situations with either perfect positive correlation or perfect negative correlation. A typical pair of stocks is going to have positive correlation, so something greater than zero, but less than one. That's because all stocks have exposure to common risks in the overall economy. Now, how positive the correlation is depends on how similar the two firms are. So let's, let's think about a few examples. So let's start with Facebook and Google. These firms are fairly similar in many ways. The correlation is going to be fairly high. Maybe it's greater than 0.5. But what about Facebook and Alcoa? These firms have somewhat similar exposure to anything that happens in the U.S. and probably a lot of things that happen around the world. But aside from that, these are very, very, very different firms. And so maybe their correlation is something like 0.1 or 0.2. Now, I also want to mention um, an airline company and an oil company. Airline stocks and oil stocks are a classic example of stocks with low, possibly even negative correlation. This happens because these two firms should have opposite exposure to oil prices. When oil prices are up, the oil company does well. Since the price of oil is related to the price of jet fuel, um, airlines will typically suffer because of that. And so when one of these does well, the other often does poorly. I want to make one final note regarding correlation. Mathematically, we'd likely compute covariance first. It'll have the same sign as correlation, but its value is unbounded. Correlation is just a standardized covariance. We like to use correlation because it's bounded between minus one and plus one. So it's easier to determine what exactly a big versus a small number is. And so to calculate um, correlation, you would take the covariance, so that's the sigma one, two, and scale it by the product of the standard deviations. So again, this is what we saw in the formulas so far. Um, just don't be alarmed if you happen to see a portfolio variance summary that is written in terms of covariances instead of correlations. And so we could take this term here and write it as 2 times the product of the weights times the covariance.